Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on RealLibertyMedia.com and RLMRadio.xyz. Oh yeah, folks, it is a Monday evening once again, 5 p.m. here in downtown Moriarty, New Mexico, on this November 4th, 2019. Yeah, this is episode 46, believe it or not, of the Grim Leftovers program. 46 times I've been here visiting y'all on this mon- on these Monday evenings. Wow. Okay, anyway, uh, so uh, hopefully you all had a great weekend and got your clocks all set and have adjusted your brains to the new, the new old time once again. Got your stolen hours back. Whew. Eleven four. That's there's a significance to that date. What is it? What is it again? Oh yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Miss Kate. Happy birthday to you. And many more. Okay. <laughs> it's Kate's birthday, so just wishing her a little happy birthday there. Uh yeah, she's 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 great. If you're not if you're not familiar with Kate, if you're not part of the Real Liberty Media chat here, come on over, jump on in and say hi and howdy to Miss Kate. Which by the way, um if you're wondering you come in here and you say, There's no Kate in here. Yeah, she spells it Q U E I T E. <laughs> a lot of people are confused by that. They think her name is Quiet or something, and, and they often don't think it's even her. But she is. She's wonderful. So come on over and say hi to Miss Kate. Uh, and the rest of the folks that are over here in the chat, too, by the way, because we have a great group of folks here. And you may not be uh, in here in the chat. You may be listening somewhere else, which would be maybe on org or... Uh, internet radio, tune in dot com, uh, all, all kinds of places, shoutcast, wherever, all kinds of places where you might be. So anyway, come on over, come on over, jump into the chat, and and, and you can talk to all the great folks that are here uh, this evening. That's right, we got the barman and the beetle and the Mister Cowboy Tech. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible singing, I know. <laughs> Anyways, but, that, but that's 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 what I do. That's what I do. Anyway, so there's Cowboy Tech and myself and the Moose Girl also there in the list. We got Anti and Asmo and Shells Sedoni. Got the Echelon and the Java Doctor. Yes, he's the doctor of all things Java. We got the Meester Meister Brow Pondergander. The Poopster and the Prince, they'll be on Thursday night. Uh, we got uh, Miss Kate, yes, she's here, and Mr. Rob Works. Uh, Trust No Romes is here. Uh, Vanna White, and uh, she's she's a great bot. Vin E, the Vincent Easley, and he'll be on tomorrow with Flash Somebody doing their show in a perfect world. Uh, so check them out at 1 p.m. in the afternoon tomorrow. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, but, 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 but where were we at? Oh, the Weather Dark Pod. Hey, Weather Dark. Dork. <laughs> he'll tell you, he'll tell you if you post a link somebody else already posted. Uh, we, we got Phantom and CZ66. Joe Skura, the lovely Miss Circle. Uh, Cyborg Noodle, half bot, half not. Um, yes, indeed. The damn Van Meter, the lovely Donna. Uh, duh, and E Man, and Siv Frumpy. Graham Z, Graham Z, you can catch her on Saturdays on the Dark Table if you want to listen to her live on the radio. Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Gromit and JJ's uh, the real Danny Wu, the sock puppet himself, yes indeed. Uh, Slim Jim Flim, he's probably at work right now. I don't know, who knows? Passed out on the floor, possibly. <laughs> Smart ass, the holiest of Rogers and uh, Zippix. Yes, yes, all these great folks here. And I do believe the lovely Miss Moose Girl will be back with us again on Friday night for the Freakers Ball. I don't think she has a concert this weekend. At least if she does, I haven't heard about it yet. So uh, any, anyway, she she does that quite often though. Uh on on the on the on the night of the of the Freakers Ball. So uh, and, and she's out there having a great time while we're here doing what we do. 
And, uh, yeah, yeah, so it's all cool, man. It's all cool. Anyway, I got a bunch of stories lined up for you. Um, some old, some not too old, some very old, some brand new. Some brand new. This is leftovers. How did that, how did that happen? I don't know, but it did. <laughs> now, I should get more of this stuff because I'm getting older. Yeah, 59 years old right now. Uh, and so this could help me. This could be this could be beneficial, and it could help you all as well. Uh, maybe some of you now, maybe some of you later. I, I don't know. But I think it, even though it says the elderly brain, I think it means any brain from very young to the oldest of old. So here it is from scientificamerican. dot com. Marijuana, weed, pot. Dope. Marijuana may boost, rather than dull, the elderly brain. And I I guess it helps maybe more if you're a mouse. I don't know. Are you a mouse? Senior mice treated with THC improved on learning and memory tests. So them them old old mice, you know. (laughs) Picture the stereotypical pot smoker. Young dazed and confused yeah that's at least just how they're they're they're, they're portrayed on the uh, on the clap you know they're not that's they're not really young dazed and confused just having a good time and old older folk that that aren't high don't understand people having a good time yeah, yeah. marijuana has long been known for its psychoactive effects which can include cognitive impairment See, again, it's cognitive shift, not necessarily impairment. But new research published in the in June in the Nature Medicine uh, suggests that the drug, again, they're calling it a drug, uh, not a drug, it's a plant, uh, might affect older users very differently than young ones, at least if you're a mouse. Uh, instead of impairing learning and memory, as it does in young people, which it doesn't do, but whatever, the, the drug appears to reverse age-related declines in the cognitive performance of elderly mice. How 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 old do mice get? I don't I don't I have no idea what the lifespan of a mouse is, but uh, apparently they do, and so they know which mice are elderly or not. Uh, researchers led by Andreas Zimmer of the University of Bonn in Germany gave low doses of Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, marijuana's main active ingredient to young, mature, and aged mice. As expected, the young mice had a good time. Yeah, they were listening to fish and... <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, young mice treated with THC performed slightly worse on behavioral tests. It's because they just don't care. It's not that they're being cognitively affected. It's just that they just don't care. Uh, uh, anyway, for example, after receiving THC, young mice took longer to learn where a safe platform was hidden in a water maze. They're just swimming around. They didn't care. And they had a harder time recognizing another mouse to which they had previously been exposed. Maybe they just didn't like that other mouse, and so they were pretending they didn't know him. Without the drug, mature and aged mice performed worse on tests than uh, young ones did. But after elderly animals were given THC, their performances improved to the point where that they resembled those of young, untreated mice. The effects were very robust, very profound. Zimmer says, two years, says Rob Works. Uh, I guess that's the lifespan of a mouse. Um, Okay. Other experts praised the study, but cautioned against extrapolating the findings to humans. This well-designed set of experiments shows that chronic, chronic, smoking a chronic, Chronic THC pretreatment appears to restore a significant level of diminished cognitive performance. What? Is that what they meant to say? Appears to restore a significant level of diminished cognitive performance in older mice. 
That's that's just odd phrasing. Anyway, while corroborating the opposite effect amongst young mice, wrote uh, Susan Weiss, director of the Division of Extramural Extramural uh, Research at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, who was not involved in the study, in an email. Nevertheless, she added, while it would be tempting to presume the relevance of these findings extends to aging humans, further research will be critically needed. Well, you know, if you need me to, to smoke some weed and, and do some little tests, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that for you. I'll smoke as much weed as you want to send me and, uh, and, uh, and I'll, I'll do your little test. <laughs> When the researchers examined the brains of the treated elderly mice for an explanation, they noticed that neurons in the hippocampus, a brain area critical for learning and memory, had sprouted more synaptic spines. Regeneration. The points of contact for communication between neurons. Even more striking, the gene expression pattern of the hippocampi of THC-treated aged mice was radically different from that of untreated elderly mice. That is something we absolutely did not expect. The old animals that received THC looked most similar to the young untreated control mice. It's, it's, it's like a cocoon effect, if you're familiar with the movie Cocoon. Yeah, it's, it's that cocoon effect that you get from smoking some weed, man. Uh, <laughs> oh man <laughs> anyway oh uh, there, there's there's a lot more to the story here but and i'll let you go ahead and read it all for yourself so yeah i'm trying to save time i've got one story that i really want to cover slightly more in depth um vin e is testing right now he's he, he he's he's covering the uh the testing parameters here and see if he can uh, improve his memory and cognitive function. <laughs> so, hooray for weed, whatever you want to call it, marijuana, cannabis, dope, pot, <laughs> all those things. But maybe you want to try something additional. Add on to that to really get that brain a uh, cooking. From the independent.co.uk, posted on June 12th of this year. No, last year. June 12th of last year. LSD and magic mushrooms could heal damaged brain cells. This says in people suffering from depression, but I'm going to go ahead and extend that. To everyone, <laughs> and they also in, in extend it to other drugs too. Uh, psychedelic drugs like LSD and ecstasy ingredient MDMA have been shown to stimulate the growth of new branches and connections between brain cells, which could help address conditions like depression and addiction. Researchers in California have demonstrated these substances banned as illicit drugs in many countries, I think pretty much all of them, are capable of rewiring parts of the brain in a way that lasts well beyond the drug's effects. This means psychedelics could be the next generation of treatments for mental health disorders which, would, which could be more effective and safer than existing options, says the studies authors from the University of California. In previous studies by the same team, a single dose of DMT, the key ingredient in ayahuasca, the medicinal brews of the Amazonian tribes, has been shown to help rats, again with the rats and the mice and the rodents, help rats overcome the fear of electric shock meant to emulate post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, they have shown this dose increases the number of branch-like dendrites sprouting from nerve cells in the rat's brains. These dendrites end at the synapses where the electrical impulses are passed on to other nerve cells and underpin all brain activity, 
but they can atrophy and draw back and people with mental health conditions like believing in the state's authority that's a severe mental health condition uh, of the hallmarks of depression is the neurites in the prefrontal cortex, a key brain region that regulates emotion, mood, and anxiety. Those neurites tend to shrivel up, says Dr. David Olson, who led the research team. These brain changes also appear in cases of anxiety, addiction, and post-traumatic stress disorder, and stimulating them to reconnect could help address this. The research published in the journal Cell Reports today looked at drugs in several classes, including tryptamines, DMT, and magic mushrooms, amphetamines, including MDA, MDMA, and ergolines like LSD. In tests on human brain cells in the lab, flies and rats had found these substances consistently boosted brain connections. I could have told you that without these tests, but again, if you need somebody to help you test some of that LSD and ayahuasca, I'm good for it. <laughs> All right. Dr. Olson, ketamine, yeah, I think I'll stay away from that one, but yeah, whatever, have fun with that. Dr. Olson compared the effects to ketamine, another illicit drug which represents one of the most important new treatments for depression in a generation, and found many psychedelics have equal or greater effects. A ketamine nasal spray, hey, that's not Dristan, is being fast-tracked through clinical trials after it was shown to rapidly relieve major depression and suicidal thoughts in people who cannot be helped by other treatments. Yeah, because once they do the, uh, the, the ketamine, the MDMA, they just want to screw all the time. Ew, I guess you got to touch something. Oh, you feel so good. Oh, yeah, you know, wonderful. Anyway, <laughs> that's the whole kind of MDMA. It's a, like a major uh, sex drug. <laughs> anyway, however, it has to be weighed against the potential for abuse and its ability to cause a form of drug-induced psychosis. Uh, the rapid effects of ketamine on mood and plasticity are truly astounding, said Dr. Olson. The big question we were trying to answer was whether or not the compounds are capable of doing what ketamine does. People have long assumed that psychedelics are capable of altering neuronal structure, but this is the first time, stu uh, the first study that clearly and unambiguously support that hypothesis. The fact that many of these drugs seem to mimic the groundbreaking benefits of ketamine opens up an array of new treatment options, which may be less open to abuse. For example, LSD. Not addictive in any mean whatsoever. And it's wonderful. <laughs> anyway, Olson said that uh, ketamine is no longer our only option. Our work demonstrates that there are a number of distinct chemical scaffolds capable of promoting plasticity like ketamine, providing additional opportunities for medicinal chemists to develop safer and more effective alternatives. So there you have it. Do some, uh, you, you, you're a little depressed, maybe? I don't know. Uh, maybe you just want to boost brain function? Uh, boost your, or expand your horizons expand your views, then go ahead and do some LSD, or shrooms, or ayahuasca, something like that. I, 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 would, I would avoid the ketamine, but that's me. Some, a lot of people really like that stuff. I, I don't know. I, it's, again, it's uh, whatever. Now, I, I have talked over the uh, long period of time that I've been doing various radio shows, not not restricted to this one, but uh, to the various radio shows I've done, so for many years, I've talked about the various benefits provided by hemp, and whether that be plastics or uh, power generation, clothing, uh, wood, uh, on and on and on. There's just so many 
positive, excellent uses for hemp. And not to mention the fact that hemp actually restores the soil where it's grown. But I had not thought of this one. This one had not crossed my mind prior to seeing this article here on the wakingtimes.com posted October 2nd. I, I think it's ingenious. You make up your own mind. Studies suggest that hemp batteries are more powerful than lithium and graphene. And you know what it takes to, to obtain lithium is you really got to destroy a lot of earth. And it's only available in certain areas in order to get that lithium out of the ground. It is a rare earth mineral. Uh, so hemp, which you can just grow anywhere, it's a freaking weed. And you can make batteries out of it. This is posted up here by Mandy Froelich of Truth Theory, truththeory.com, and on the wakingtimes.com. Hemp is an incredibly versatile crop. Not only can it be used for industrial purposes, clothing, food, and paper, but new research suggests hemp batteries are even more powerful than lithium in graphene. Uh, the experiment was conducted by Robert Murray Smith and was discussed on his relatively popular YouTube channel. Smith began observing a volts by amps curve of both the hemp and lithium batteries. Surprisingly, the power underneath the hemp cell was a value of 31, while the lithium cell had a value of just 4. So over 7 times there. Uh, Smith does not claim to have proven anything. Rather, he says the results of the experiment simply show the performance of the hemp cell significantly better than the lithium cell. And there's a video here to show you exactly that, uh, what, what he did. The, this discovery is not new. In 2014, researchers in the United States found that waste fibers, shiv, from hemp crops can be transformed into ultra-fast supercapacitors that are better than graphene. For those who are unaware, graphene is a unique synthetic carbon material that is lighter than foil as well as bulletproof. The main limit to using it is feasibility. Fortunately, hemp costs one one-thousandth the price of graphene. People ask me, why hemp? I say, why not? Said Dr. Martin. We're making graphene-like materials for a thousandth of the price, and we're doing it with waste material. The, the fibers were then recycled into supercapacitors, or energy storage devices, which have changed the way electronics are powered. Conventional batteries store large res reservoirs of energy and drip feed. Supercapacitors, on the other hand, rapidly discharge their entire load. Yeah, they blow their load really quick. As a result, the latter is an ideal in machines that require sharp bursts of power. Yeah, 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 yeah. According to Mitlin, you can do really interesting things with bio-waste. With banana peels, for instance, you can turn them into a dense block of carbon. We call it pseudo-graphite, and that's great for sodium ion batteries. But if you look at hemp fiber, its structure is the opposite. It makes sheets of high surface area, and it's very conductive to supercapacitors, conducive to supercapacitors. After the bark has been cooked, you dissolve the lignin and the semicellulose, and it leaves these carbon nanosheets, a pseudo-graphene structure. The resulting supercapacitors operate at a broad range of temperatures and high energy density. The peer-reviewed journal paper ranks the device on par with or better than commercial graphene-based devices. They work down to zero degrees C and display some of the best power energy combinations reported in the literature for any carbon, Mitlin explained. For example, at a very high power density of 20 kilowatts per kilogram, 
uh, the, the temperature of 20, 60, and 100 degrees C. The energy densities are at 1934 and 40 watt hours per kilo, respectively. When fully assembled, the energy density is 12 watt hours per, per kilogram, which can be achieved at a charge of less than six seconds. Amazing. Amazing. Anyway, um, some, something to consider, you know. I, like I said, I've considered a lot of different valuable things that hemp can do. And hemp plastics is, is one of my big things to, to suggest to people because everybody always wants to ban all the plastics. Ban all the plastics. And I say, no, don't ban plastics. Just quit using the freaking petroleum-based plastics and use hemp plastics. But if you could do this for power storage, wow, um, that's terrific. Okay, this next one is one I really wanted to go into detail with. Uh, I'm not going to cover the whole thing because it is fairly lengthy. But it's something that you should know and you should recall if you were alive and breathing and able to read 10 years ago. And it's, it's very important to me. It may be the most important issue out there, more important than any of the political bullshit, for sure, which is not important at all, but more important than things like Sandy hoax or any uh, other gun shootings, the gun confiscation, more important than that, uh, more, more, more important than, than the 5G and all the damage it's going to do, more important than the big pharma crap and all the damage they're doing on a daily basis, All more important than everything else because of the scale of what they're trying to push and how they're trying to push it and what they're trying to do to you over the whole global warming slash climate change thing and the fact that so many people believe absolutely believe in the climate change global warming nonsense so when i saw this article and i just saw it this morning although it was posted on friday um, and back when it when when the, when this issue first occurred, I talked about it tremendously, a lot. But but it got shoved down, it got pushed away, and that wasn't just me talking about it. Lots of people were talking about it, but they quieted it, they hid it. They don't want anybody to know that this is the truth, and not not all of their climate change, global warming propaganda nonsense that's pushed on a daily basis so here it is and because it's been this long now let me get a sip of water and i'll go on more important than bacon well bacon's a different area of importance uh, I, I don't want to diss bacon <laughs> but here you go post it on what's up with that dot com by a guest blogger. Climate Gate. Nearly 10 years later. It's very close to 10 years later. When Climate Gate sprang into, into the public light before they crushed it. Climate alarmists are still promoting junk science, fossil fuel bans, and wealth redistribution. Dr. Kelvin Kem. This is this, this, this 17th of this month, the 17th of this month, marks the 10th anniversary of Climate Gate. The release of thousands of emails to and from climate scientists who had been, and still are, collaborating and colluding to create a man-made climate crisis that exists in their minds and their computer models, but not in the real world. The scandal should, very importantly, should have ended climate catastrophism. Instead, it was studiously buried by the politicians, scientists, activists, and crony capitalists who will rake in trillions, trillions of dollars from the exaggerations and fakery while exempting exempting themselves from
from the damage they are inflicting on everyday families. Few people know that the, or know of, the inconvenient facts about the supposed man-made climate change, or man-made climate and extreme weather crisis. For example, since 1998, average global temperatures have risen by a mere few hundredths of a degree. For a time, they even declined slightly. Yet, we all have... All, all we hear is baseless rhetoric about man-made carbon dioxide causing global warming and climate changes that pose existential threats to humanity, wildlife, and planet. Based on this, we are told we must stop, just cease to use fossil fuel, fuels to power economic growth and better living standards. This is bad news for Africa. And the world. We keep hearing that the rising atmospheric carbon, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels cause rising global temperatures. However, satellite data show no such thing. In fact, computer model predictions for 2019 are almost half a degree Celsius or nine tenths of a degree Fahrenheit above actual satellite measurements. Wait, no, how are they doing that? They, they, <laughs> their, their models are showing temperatures almost a whole degree uh, above what the satellite data is showing. Huh. Even worse, any time a scientist raises questions about the alleged crisis, he or she is denounced as a Climate change denier. I'm a denier! <laughs> Probably tr trust no one. <laughs> uh, the major source of data supporting the human CO2-induced warming proposition came from the Climate Research Unit, the CRU, of the University of East Anglia in the UK. Then, on the morning of, seven, uh, of 17 November... 2009, a Pandora's box of embarrassing CRU information exploded onto the world scene. A computer hacker penetrated the university's computer system and took 61 megabytes of material, not really that much, that showed the CRU had been manipulating scientific information to make global warming appear to be the fault of mankind and industrial CO2. Among other scandals, the shocking leaked emails showed the CRU director, Professor Phil Jones, boasting the usual statistical tricks to remove evidence of observed declines in global temperatures. He was boasting about using statistical tricks to remove evidence of, of actual global, uh, declines in global temperatures. In another email, he advocated deleting data rather than providing it to scientists who did not share his view and might possibly criticize his analysis. Non-alarmist scientists had to invoke the British Freedom of Information laws to get the information. Jones was later suspended, and former British Chancellor Lord Lawson called for a government inquiry into the embarrassing expose. The affair became known as Climate Gate, and a group of university students even posted a YouTube song called Hide the Decline. And we here all know the song Hide the Decline, posted up on YouTube by the Minnesotans for Global Warming, or M4GW. We've played the song on the Freakers Ball many times, and we will continue to play it. Hide the Decline. Mocking the CRU and the climate modeler, Dr. Michael Mann, in his man-made climate change nonsense, who used the phrase, he used the phrase, Dr. Mann uh, used the phrase, hide the decline in temperatures that had been found in hacked emails. 
So what's the truth? If one considers the composition of the atmosphere and equates it to the height of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, the extra plant fertilizing CO2 added to the atmosphere since California became the 31st state of the U.S. in 1850, less than the thickness of the tiles under the tower. That's how much additional CO2 there that he's giving, and I think that's even an exaggeration. He says less than, but I'm saying much less than. So, if you consider how tall the Eiffel Tower is, and you look at the tiles that are down below the Eiffel Tower, and you, they're, they're just these, these little tiles down there. Uh, uh, that's what he's saying was possibly added, less than that, possibly added to the atmosphere by this CO2. Can this tiny increase really explain any observed global warming since the Little Ice Age ended and the modern industrial era began? Since California became a state, the measured global rise in atmospheric temperature has been less than one degree C. But most of this increase occurred prior to 1940, and the average planetary temperatures fell from around 1943 until about 1978, leading to a global cooling scare. Temperatures rose slightly until 1998, and then mostly remained stable, even as carbon dioxide levels continued to rise. Rising CO2 levels and temperature variations do not correlate very well at all. Moreover, the well-documented medieval warming period from about 950 to 1350 A.D., warmer global temperatures allowed Viking farmers to raise crops and tend cattle in Greenland. The equally well-documented 500-year Little Ice Age starved and froze the Vikings out of Greenland before reaching its coldest point the Maunder Minimum, in 1645 through 1715. That's when England's River Thames regularly froze over. Norwegian farmers demanded compensation for lands buried by advancing glaciers, and priests performed exorcism rituals to keep alpine glaciers away from villages. Not that that helped at all, but they, they did. <coughs> Paintings from the era... Uh, show crowds of people ice skating and driving horse-drawn carriages across the River Thames. Industrial and automobile emissions obviously played no role at all in either the medieval warming period or the Little Ice Age. These dramatic events should ring warning bells for any competent, honest scientist. Very key, competent, honest scientist. Those are very rare, hard to find. If the medieval warming period occurred without industrial CO2 driving it, why should industrial CO2 be causing any observed warming today? Europe's Great Plague wiped out nearly a quarter of its population during the Little Ice Age. The warm period brought prosperity and record crops while cold years brought misery, famine, and death. Yes, we could all use a little global warming. Ten years before ClimateGate, Dr. Mann released a computer-generated graph purporting to show global temperatures over the previous 1,500 years. His graph mysteriously made the medieval warming period and Little Ice Age and Maunder Extreme cold years disappear, vanish, poof. The planetary temperatures spike suddenly the last couple decades of the 20th century. The graph had the shape of a hockey stick and was published worldwide and became the centerpiece for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Oh, the lovely hockey stick. Many scientists were highly suspicious of the hockey stick claims. Two of them, Stephen McIntyre and Ross McKittrick, completely discredited man's computer program and revisionist history. 
Of course, this did not stop the U.S. former, the former U.S. Vice President Al Gore from using this discredited graph in his doom and gloom climate change propaganda movie, An Inconvenient Truth. The hacked CRU emails also showed exchanges between Mann and Jones in which they discussed how to intimidate editors who wanted to publish scientific views contrary to theirs to suppress any contradictory studies. In one email, Jones expressed his desire to get rid of the troublesome editor of the Climate Research Journal for daring to publish differing views. The editor got sacked. While the University of Colorado climate skeptic Professor Roger Pelkey, Jr. asked the CRU for its original temperature readings, he was told the data had been, conveniently, lost. Lost? Are you kidding me? Do professionals lose something as valuable as original data? Many suspected they just didn't want anyone to expose their clever manipulations and fabrications. <laughs> the article goes on a bit, but you get the idea, and I hopefully, I hope you all will go through and read read this article in its uh, entirety and share it as many places as you possibly can. Because, let me tell you, th there is nothing more insidious than, than what they plan to do with this whole climate change nonsense. And that is to control pretty much every breath you take, every move you make, as the police would say. Um... Not those police, the the, the band, <laughs> because they want to be able to control you. They want to be able to tax your breath. They want to be able to tax every single thing you do, and that through that taxation is control, and through that control they can do all kinds of things to you. They can make you stop eating meat, stop driving personal cars, stop having your own private homes. That they could do all these things in the name of saving the planet. When it's all nonsense. It's, it's all made up. It's manufactured. It's bullshit. But people are believing it. People are buying it. Uh, in, in a big way out there. It, it's, it's, it's incredible. Now, this, this, this is the primary issue uh, as far as I am concerned. Um, years back, before before this came out, I believed it was... Uh, economic issues and the fake economy and the fake money and all that. But uh, th this has definitely overtaken that in a big way. And uh, hopefully um, you spread this information as far and wide as possible, especially to those that are believers in the human-caused global warming, human-caused climate change stuff. It's crazy. It's crazy. <coughs> Excuse me. Sock Puppet points out in the chat here, and quite rightly so, that Al Gore has high stakes in carbon credits. And carbon credits, uh, you're going to find those on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and CME, uh, being traded back and forth for lots and lots of money. And you can buy carbon credits to allow your companies or personal, personal cells, if you're into that, uh, to continue polluting as much as you want, as long as you pay them. <laughs> it's okay to pollute as long as you pay, because that way, once you pay, it doesn't pollute anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't add to the global warming, because you've paid the thing. <laughs> it is all related, Rob. Uh, there, there, there is... Uh, there's no doubt about it. It's all related. And yes, Moose Girl, it's hard to convince. It's it's hard to change uh, people's minds that you know that you you show them the evidence, you show them the proof, and they and they call you like an oil company shill or something. It's amazing. Uh, and I, I I just wow. Okay. Anyway, you know my views on the matter. You know how important I think it is, and you know that I hope. You all spread that 
that information, not just that one, all, all, there's all, all, there's tons of information. And if you look back through the, the various Freakers Ball and, and, and uh, Grim Leftovers blog posts, you'll, you'll see posts almost every week uh, about this climate change, global warming nonsense. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> wow. Okay, now this article came out a few, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and, and I found it interesting, and I thought, hey, I, I, need to share this. I need to share this with people. I don't, I don't know anything about this website, but it has documentation and links to studies and such things like that. So it's posted up here on redpillinfowar.com. I don't know if that's got anything to do with Alex Jones and his nonsense, uh, but it's called redpillinfowar.com. Posted on October 14th here. Harvard immunologists to legislatures, legislators. Unvaccinated children pose zero risk to anyone. Now what? Now what? <laughs> She's got some name. Uh, it sounds like uh, Eastern European. I can't really pronounce it. Dr. Tetiana Obakamanich, I guess, whatever. Uh, anyway, an open letter to legislators currently considering vaccine legislation from Tetanya Obud Kanyich. Dear legislator, my name is, with that name I just said, I hold a PhD in immunology. I am writing this letter in hope that it will correct several common misconceptions about vaccines in order to help you formulate a fair and balanced understanding that is supported by accepted vaccine theory and new scientific findings. Question. Do unvaccinated children pose a higher threat to the public than the vaccinated? It is often stated that those who choose not to vaccinate their children for reasons of being of, of conscious in, in danger to the rest of the public, and this is the rationale behind most of the legislation to end vaccine exemptions currently being considered by federal and state legislatures countrywide. You should be aware that the nature, nature of protection afforded by many modern vaccines, and that includes most of the vaccines recommended by the CDC for children, is not consistent with such a statement. I have outlined below the recommended vaccines that cannot prevent transmission of disease, either because they are not designed to prevent transmission of the infection, rather they are intended to prevent disease symptoms, or because they are for non-communicable diseases. People who have not received the vaccines mentioned below pose no higher threat to the general public than those who have implying that discrimination against non-immunized children in a public school setting may not be warranted. IPV, or the inactivated polio vaccine, cannot prevent transmission of polio virus. And if you listen back to some of my uh, recent previous shows, you'll see that the uh, uh, the polio vaccine, polio virus vaccine, actually causes and spreads the polio virus. <laughs> that, that's not mentioned in here, but just be aware that that's that is the case. Wild polio virus has been non-existent in the USA for at least 20 years. Even if wild polio virus were to be reimported by travel, vaccinating for polio with IPV cannot affect the safety of public spaces. Please note that the wild polio virus eradication is attributed to the use of a different vaccine, OPV, or oral polio vaccine. Uh, despite being capable of preventing wild polio virus transmission, use of OPV was phased out a long time ago in the U.S. of A. and replaced with the IPV, which does not do what you are saying that it does, due to safety concerns. Tetanus. Tetanus is not a contagious disease, but rather acquired from a deep puncture wound contaminated with C. tetani spores 
vaccinating for tetanus via the DTAP combination vaccine cannot alter the safety of public spaces. It is intended to render personal protection only. Number three, while intended to prevent disease, uh, causing effects of the diphtheria toxin, the diphtheria toxoid vaccine, also known or contained in the DTAP vaccine, is not designed to prevent colonization and, uh, and transmission of C. diphtheria. Vaccinating for diphtheria cannot alter the safety of public spaces. It is likewise intended for personal protection only. Okay. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to speed through a little bit of this here. Uh, she goes on and talking about pertussis, um, flu, flu, the, the, the flu vaccine. HIV vaccine covers only the type B despite its sole intention to reduce symptomatic and asymptomatic disease. Um, so using the, the flu vaccine, that it, 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 if you have an unvaccinated kid discriminating against children who are not vaccinated, for the HIV uh, influenza does not make any scientific sense in the era of non-type B H influenza. Hepatitis B is a blood-borne virus. Again, that's uh, not going to spread around. Um, she also covers the uh, HPV and uh, ma many other vaccines here. Just be aware that if your kids are unvaccinated, they are posing zero, zero risk to anyone <laughs> all right all right <laughs> okay I, mean, I just had to speed through that I, I know i'm running out of time i spent a lot of time on the global warming nonsense but i, I had to I had to all right on cns news cns news uh, on october 2nd terrence p jeffrey posted a commentary here with actual numbers to prove his point Americans spent more on taxes in 2018 than on food, clothing, and health care combined. And I'll just say this. The word spent is an absolute misnomer. Americans had more money stolen from them by the government thieves, not spent more on taxes, had more money stolen from them than they spent on food, clothing, and health care combined. Yes, Americans on average were stolen from, in 2018, uh, more than they did on the basic necessity. Basic necessity, the food, clothing, and health care combined. According, according to the government's own numbers, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The survey's recently published Table R1 for 2018 lists the average detailed expenditures of what the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, calls consumer units. Consumer units, say the BLS, include family, single persons living alone, or sharing a household with others, but who are financially independent, or two or more persons living together who share major expenses. So in 2018, according to the R1 American Consumer Units, spent an average of $9,031.93 on federal income taxes, $5,023.73 on Social Security taxes, which the tables calls deductions, $2,084.62 on state and local income taxes, $2,199.80 on property taxes, and $77.85 on what the BLS calls other taxes. The combined payments... The average American consumer, you, this doesn't even include sales taxes, by the way, um, <laughs> which we won't go there. Uh, the combined payments, the average American consumer unit made for these five categories of taxes was $18,000, $18,617.93. The same average American consumer unit was paying these, uh, paying these taxes. It was spending $7,923 on food, $5,000 on health care, $1,870 on apparel and services. These combined expenditures equaled under $15,000.
compared to the almost $19,000 that were stolen from them in various taxes. Like I said, various, because, you know, uh, if you have any, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> there's all kinds of other things you get taxed on that are not included in what they included there. So just bear in mind, you are being stolen from at a massive rate. Oh, <laughs> all right, all right. This next one I put up just because I found it humorous. Because I, it was my assumption, anyway. I, 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 I was, I, <laughs> and I apologize ahead of time for any Apple users we may have here. <laughs> because I assumed that if you were going to buy an Apple product, you know, you're probably, you're probably already halfway there. <laughs> A Russian man, a Russian man is suing Apple for turning him gay. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying that because, you know, the typical Apple user. Uh, enough said. Anyway, and, 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 excuse me. And what's what's perhaps one of the most frivolous lawsuits? In recent memory, a Russian man says his iPhone dro drove him to homosexuality, and he's suing Apple. Uh, the plaintiff told the local radio station he became mired in same-sex relationships earlier this year after receiving 69 gay coins on a... <laughs> 69 gay coins. I don't, I don't know if that's really a coin, or if that's a number of coins. Is it a 69 gay coin, or did he get 69... Anyway, on a cryptocurrency payment app he downloaded onto his iPhone in 2017, according to the Moscow Times. Needless to say, that's ridiculous. Trying out a same-sex relationship can't turn you gay. But that didn't stop the man from suing. <laughs> I saw it. Indeed, how could I judge something without trying it? The plaintiff wrote in a complaint published by the station, and decided to go ahead and try some same-sex relationships. <laughs> now the man has regrets. I have a steady boyfriend, and I, I don't know how to explain it to my parents, read the complaint. After receiving the aforementioned message, my life has changed for the worse, and uh, I will never be normal again. <laughs> All right. Anyway, there is more there on that story, should you so desire. But I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I. <coughs> like I said, no offense to Apple users, but you know. <laughs> All right. Posted on the New York Post, October second here. I call this natural selection. This, this, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the whole natural selection thing, but I would call this natural selection. Kids are getting sick from eating vaping cartridges full of liquid nicotine. They're doing what? <laughs> And, you know, you can't blame them if it's infants and toddlers and things like that. But uh, if they're older than that, anyway, doctors in Kansas are sounding the alarm over vaping-related trend where young children get a hold of their parents' devices and consume the whole cartridges full of liquid nicotine. We've had kids eating the cartridges, cartridges drink the solutions, and get sick. Uh, the, the Poison Center fielded nine in the past few weeks and calls about youngsters getting a hold of e-cigarettes or vaping pods, the, re, the report said. Uh, we, we have kids, what, I, uh, uh, the poison, uh, the, the parents are calling saying, hey, I found my kid holding the vaping product, or I found the kid with the e-cigarette pod in their mouth. Where, where are you putting this? You know, you gotta, you got to keep these out of the... Out of the, the kids' mouths. <laughs> I don't know. 
So we ha actually have a bit of an uptick in that. We've had kids ingest the cartridges, and they got pretty bad toxicity from the nicotine because it's very, very concentrated in those little pods. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if kids are eating these things, and that, that, that's really, it's on the parents if they're, if they're infants and toddlers. Uh, older than that, then I'm going to go with natural selection. All right. And finally, lastly, but not leastly, five bulls found dead in Oregon. Then the story gets weird. This is on CBS Austin on October 2nd here. Salem, Oregon. The first dead bull was found in a timbered ravine in eastern Oregon. There was no indication it had been shot, attacked by predators, or eaten poisonous plants. The animal's sex organ and tongue had been removed. All the blood was gone. Totally ensanguinated. Exsanguinated. In the next few days... Four more Hereford bulls were found within, within one and a half miles of, in the same condition. There were no tracks around the carcasses. Ranch management and law enforcement suspect that someone killed the bulls. Ranch hands have been advised to travel in pairs and to go armed. Ever since the bulls were found over several days in July, Harney County Sheriff Deputy Dan Jenkins has received many calls and emails from people speculating what or who might be responsible. Theories range from scavengers such as carrion bugs eating the carcasses to people attacking the animals to cause financial harm to the ranchers. Jenkins, who is leading the investigation that also involves state police, has run into only dead ends and has no witnesses. If anyone has concrete information or knows of any cases that have been solved in the past, we, we that would definitely be helpful, he said. Colby Marshall, uh, a vice president of Sills Valley Ranch that owned the bulls, has another theory. We think the crime is being perpetuated by some sort of cult. The case recalls mutilations of livestock across the U.S. West and Midwest in the 1970s that struck fear in rural areas. Thousands of cattle and livestock, ranging from Minnesota to New Mexico, were found dead, with their reproductive organs and sometimes part of their faces removed. Ranchers began carrying guns. Folks said helicopters had been heard around the kill scenes. A federal agency canceled an inventory by helicopter of its lands in Colorado, worried that it would get shot down. A couple of U.S. senators urged the FBI to investigate, according to FBI documents. After saying it lacked jurisdiction, the FBI agreed to investigate cases on tribal lands, but the mutilation stopped. Former FBI agent Kenneth Rommel who headed to the investigation, said there was no indication of anything other than common predators being responsible. Cases have emerged sporadically since then. In the 80s, a few more cows were found dead and, and mutilated in eastern Oregon. More recently, there have been cases near a ranch in Flagstaff, Arizona. Some of the mutilations can be attributed to natural causes. An animal drops dead, the blood pools at the bottom of the carcass, it bloats, the skin dries out and splits, tears, uh, the tears off and appear surgical, carrying b bugs, birds, and other scavengers go for the soft tissues. Makes sense. David Bonert, director of the Oregon State University's Eastern Oregon uh, Agricultural Research Center in Burns, said he believes people killed the most recent bulls because there's no indication they were felled by predators or had eaten pit poisonous plants. Let me just jump down here to the punchline. Where is it? <laughs> oh, you know the punchline. I don't have to find it here. Aliens! Wait, I'm not saying it was aliens, but it was aliens. <laughs> <All right. laughs> 
<laughs> All right, folks. Sorry I ran over. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. I'll be back again next Monday with another episode of The Grim Leftovers. Uh, Flash and Vinny will be on tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern uh, with, with, with the the In a Perfect World show. Check the schedule on RealLibertyMedia.com for all the rest of the shows throughout the week. And stay tuned, if you will. Um, I appreciate y'all being here with me, tuned in. Uh, you know, you guys are great. Uh, and uh, I, I like all y'all supporting RealLibertyMedia.com. So uh, I will talk to y'all later. Have a great night and a great week. Happy birthday, Kate! Later. Peace!